everyone, and welcome to One Shoal. My name is Rabbi Patrick Olive. Being a little casual today with my hat and my hoodie and my t-shirts, decided to be a little bit more casual than usual. Um, I'm very excited that you're here for our early Shabbat service, or as I've been calling it, the UK Shabbat service. Um, you know, we really want to be able to serve everybody and to provide Jewish community to as many people as possible. So that's why, even though it's 2 o'clock here in Atlanta, 11 o'clock in L.A. with our uh, friends out on the West Coast, and 8-ish 
uh, across the Atlantic, we can still celebrate Shabbat together. Uh, we will give you guys just a few more minutes to sign into our chat room. If you don't know how to do that, you can pop a little message. Um, please create a username and password. Please um, get in the chat room. We want to get to know each other. We want to uh, learn from each other. We want to celebrate Shabbat together. This is the uh, music video Shabbat service. I haven't done it in a while, so I'm looking forward to getting back into it. And also, the theme of tonight's service is, would you rather be right or be happy? Would you rather be right or be happy? We'll give you a few minutes to get logged into the chat room to go on ahead and get into uh, the spirit of Shabbat, and we will begin with uh, this wonderful music video in just a moment. So... My name is Rabbi Patrick Olive. If this is your first time at One Shul, welcome. We are an online, pluralistic Jewish community. So what does that mean, pluralistic? Um, I've always taken it to mean that everyone is welcome, that everyone has a place, that everyone can get involved that wants to be involved. So whether you are an Orthodox Jew or you're a Reform or maybe you're not Jewish, you're just a spiritual seeker, uh, whether you are gay, lesbian, whether you are uh, transgender, uh, wherever you are, whoever you are, there's probably a place for you here at One Shul. Uh, we have all different types of services and classes available all the time, so even just this week alone we have some amazing things going on. This is our uh, 2 o'clock Eastern Shabbat service, so I like to call it our UK Shabbat service. Um, at 7 o'clock Eastern we have a Rosh Chodesh uh, Shabbat service with Ketzira. So that's tonight. We also have tomorrow, uh, Mariv and Havdalah at 7 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time. And then we start back again on Monday. We have a great class on the sages and our Torah study class. So we have something for everybody. Wherever you are in life, uh, there is something here for you. So we're going to begin tonight's Shabbat service with this really beautiful version of Yadid Nefesh. No need for a siddur. Just sit back and relax and enjoy, and Shabbat Shalom.
Absolutely. Love that version of Yadid Nefesh. How about something a little bit more sing-songy, something that we can all get into? This is actually my favorite Jewish song, and this is my favorite version of this song. So this is from the Zamru community. Uh, Zamru is an independent Jewish community of Chavura. Um, I believe in the Princeton area. And they're independent just like we are. They do get together physical Shabbat services as opposed to our online ones. Um, but they're very musical. Um, I've always wanted to go and check them out because they sound really, really cool. This is a recording of them doing Shiru Ladonai. Um, I love this version. And the great thing about it is they have the words uh, of the song transliterated. So you can sing along as well. So this is the Zamru community's Shiru Ladonai. Zamru is absolutely incredible, and I love that version. Um, got another great version of a song for you here. I hope that you're a fan of Leonard Cohen. I hope you're a fan of Jeff Buckley, um, because this version of Lechado D is based around um, 
well, you, you just have to see it. It's just wonderful. This is, this version of Lajado D is, is wonderful, and you'll catch the melody if you know what I'm talking about. So here it is, our next Shabbat song, Lajado D. Hi there, Arden in Chicago, uh, for you and for all our fans there. No, just for you. Just for you. Sorry, just for you. Okay. You'll guess which song it is in a moment. My uh, Listen. So, hallelujah, Leonard Cohen, 
sort of Jeff Buckley-ish mixed in with there. So Lacha Dodi. So we've had Yedid Nefesh. Um, we've had Lacha Dodi, Shiru Ladonai. Um, this is the Kabbalat Shabbat aspect of our service. Um, I'd like to sort of give a little Devar Torah here around the question that I asked earlier, which is, would you rather be right or be happy? And it looks like the vote in the chat room is to be both right and happy. <laughs> um, or, okay, maybe just happy. So... So here's what this is about. Parsha Truma, this is this week's Torah portion. Now when you're writing a Devar Torah, the goal is to try to find something in the text that speaks to you as a writer and then expand upon it to relate it to life today. Uh, generally speaking, you're told to tell a joke to start things off or to grab your audience in some kind of way uh, to meaningfully relate to people. But then ultimately, at the end of the day, it's not about telling jokes, and it's not about necessarily relating to people, but it's about imparting some sort of Torah wisdom. And you never have to be afraid, I've been told by some rabbi friends of mine, that, uh, you know, uh, that whatever you're teaching isn't original, right? Or that um, what you uh, are teaching... <clears throat> may not be exactly right. Because the idea is that eventually, if you go um, far enough back in time, it's going to hit all the way at Sinai. So you're one step, and then you go one step back, and then another step back, and another step back to the trail that leads back to the Sinai experience. right? So even if what you're doing is not terribly original, not terribly new, or if it's a little off-kilter, eventually it's going to find its way back if you did a good job. Um, so this idea is really about the details, and that's what Truma is about too. Uh, Parsha Truma explains in painfully boring detail the construction of the Mishkan, the tabernacle, in the wilderness. So in theory, when you have a really dense Torah portion, when you have a lot of stuff going on, you can pick any number of interesting highlights. You talk about the Holy of Holies, we talk about the showbread, we could talk about uh, the actual physical structure of the Mishkan, the gold and the silver and the copper that was used in the building of the, the sort of compound, if you want to call it that. There's all kinds of details that you could put into finding a spiritual lesson in this how to build a tabernacle Ikea-esque uh, instruction manual, right? Um, details, details, details. Now, what about details? I've been thinking a little bit about details. <clears throat> I have spent a tremendous amount of time online. Matter of fact, if you friend me on Facebook, my, my personal Facebook, you'll see that my banner uh, image at the top of my Facebook is actually a thing that Time Magazine did. It was about how much time have you spent uh, on Facebook. So I think I've been on Facebook since 2010, I want to say. And according to Facebook, or not according to Facebook, according to Time Magazine, which has this little app where you can see how much time you've spent on Facebook, since 2010, I have spent 16 days on Facebook. 16 days. 16 full days on Facebook, right? So I've lost over two weeks of my life being on Facebook. Now, a friend of mine on Facebook made the argument that it's not really wasting time if you're connecting with your friends and family, if you're maybe doing your job, which, quite frankly, Facebook's a lot of my job. Um, it's not really losing time or wasting time. But nonetheless, I have spent 16 days on Facebook, and I have the photographic evidence to prove it. Now, having spent a lot of time on websites like Facebook and Tumblr and Reddit, um, I'm now on... Um, I'm on Tumblr now. Uh, let's see, what else, have, what else have I been on? Friendster, I was on that for a while. Um, I think in my dating life, I might have been on some dating websites, things like that. But having spent a lot of time on these different social... Twitter is another one. Uh, all these different social media websites. I've learned a lot about how people communicate. At the end of the day, all of these websites are really something much older. Uh, they're really a bulletin board system. You know, you have one person commenting on another person, commenting on another person, and you have these conversations. It's actually a lot like the Talmud, interestingly enough. It's all of these conversations that can happen in a very short period of time, like on Facebook, people commenting every 10 minutes or 5 minutes over really long periods of time. If you go into a, let's say, a troubleshooting 
a bulletin board, for a piece of software, for a website. You know, someone may post something in January and then someone a year and a half later is posting their comment on it, right? So it's going to be a very short period of time, a very long period of time, depending on sort of where it is. What I've learned, though, is that people are really into details. Just like, as I was saying earlier with Truma, um, and the details type stuff gets to be a little tricky whenever you're talking about a debate of some kind. So it's something like politics or religion or sports um, or talking about someone like a celebrity. Um, you see these details, 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 details. And uh, people, if they have kind of a snarky personality, like to really get into it with people. Um, Facebook, in particular, is one of those areas where I've seen people just really get into it with each other about details of people's lives, um, celebrities and uh, artists and musicians and things like that, really just tearing into them. Or with politicians, you know, a politician screws up, does something they're not supposed to do, and then it's just tearing them alive. Um, I, had a, I have a friend uh, who has a friend who writes for HuffPost, and we were talking about this kind of idea of people online commenting on things and stuff like that, and he said, you know, I would never want to be a writer. And I said, why that? Why is that? Because a lot of his colleagues, he's a rabbi, a lot of his colleagues do that. You know, they, they really just have to be online all the time. They have to be posting their stuff. And he said, you know, all my, all my friends do that. They really think it's publish or perish. Um, he said, but I would never want to do that because I have a friend who writes for HuffPost who has gotten threats against his family where people have said, I hope you die. Uh, really severe types of stuff, right? He said, I could never do that. I would never want to expose myself to that. So, blogging is not in his future, that's for sure. But it is true. I've seen people really get into details, you know, fundamentalist Christians and atheists fighting, uh, different types of Jewish groups fighting with each other, people fighting over music stuff, and people will get into these incredible details. The Beatles, my goodness, if you read people talking about the Beatles or any famous band, you'll see the, the back and forth people will have about minute details of how was something recorded or what kind of guitar did they play on this part of this song, on this album. I mean, very hyper-specific stuff. As I mentioned earlier, in the Jewish world, you see this a lot. Um, I got an email today from someone um, that's been volunteering for our community, and she said, you know, I had to leave this one Facebook group because people were just getting nasty with each other about, I don't even remember what the, the topic was that she was talking about, but she felt really disappointed because she enjoyed that Facebook group any, uh, uh, before, and now these people were coming in and kind of spoiling it. Um... So what I've seen with sort of civility online um, is this just intense desire um, to catch people, to have aha moments or gotcha. I think gotcha moments is really what I mean. Um, you know, something about being on the Internet makes us believe that we have a certain right to... Um, uh, a certain right to make people own up to things, right? To expose everything, to make everything public. Um, and I suppose in the past this was the area that journalists um, lived in. That was their kind of space, um, was sort of shedding light on things. But at the same time, with any kind of media comes responsibility, right? So there were things that newspapers wouldn't publish back in the day. Uh, there were certain things you wouldn't say on TV or wouldn't say on the radio, um, because the feeling was that for uh, any new kind of media that comes out, there's a certain kind of responsibility uh, or a certain type of etiquette that comes along with it. The internet, because it's so unregulated, um, and because it's purely cross-cultural in a way that other types of media really never have been before, um, there is none of that. There are no sort of rules of engagement that are, I think, collectively understood. Things like capitalizing every word. You know, I remember that was a big thing. Never capitalize or cap lock every word, right? Because that means you're screaming. But how many times do I get emails from people that do that or see things online or, or people just writing blogs where they do that? Um, so we don't have this collective sense of sort of a, an ethics of the Internet when it comes to conversation. Something about the Internet falsely makes us believe, particularly in Jewish life, that we are the Sanhedrin 
and all other people are, are the accused. And a lot of times, if you make a comment like that, people think you mean it's the, the orthodox versus the non-orthodox, right? That it's uh, the, re the religious, right? Because all non-orthodox Jews are the non-religious, uh, and then there's the orthodox Jews who are the religious. Um, and that's not what I mean. I don't even believe that, by the way. Um, I've met plenty of non-religious, non-orthodox Jews. Um, what I mean by that is just um, a desire for people to catch each other in the details. I don't remember who said this or what the origin of this phrase is, but the devil is in the details, and I find that to be very true. People will try to catch each other all the time on, well, you didn't quote that properly, or well, that comes from a different part of the Talmud, or, or well, didn't you see this link to this website that says this thing that's different than that thing? Uh, and really sort of taking this uh, discourse style of Judaism, which is really, frankly, the Judaism we have now. It's, it's an intellectual pursuit. It's a creative pursuit. It's a, a, chavut, a chavruta you know, type of, of Judaism, but amping it out, amping it up in a way that is just frightening. I mean, the, the level of stress that people will put into it. Um, and it really kind of goes to that quote, wherever that quote comes from, that the devil is in the details, the, the, uh, the Lashon Hara is in the details, the Yetzir Hara, the evil impulse, uh, is sometimes in the details. There's a term for this. There's a term for when people um, go online and they go on these bulletin board type of websites, these social media websites, and they just have this intense desire to... Um, be known on these sites. And the, the term is actually, it's a, somewhere online, this became the, the terminology, the term is trolling. I don't know exactly where trolling comes from, but that's what it's called. So, internet trolling, in a desperate attempt to destroy people and their politics, philosophy, their thoughts on sports teams, religion, whatever, I think for some people must be a genuine hobby. Um, it, it must really be something they really get a lot out of because you see a lot of it all the time. Um, and I don't know if it's because people have that much free time or if it's because now that our cell phones are connected to Facebook and all of these other sites, if you just have access to it all the time. So it's so easy to quickly you know, jump on people and jump on conversations. Um, but it's amazing to me when I look at it how much time people spend on this kind of stuff. Now, apparently it's a huge problem. When I was working on this Devar, I did a little research, not that much, but I found that there are actually some people who believe that um, internet trolling uh, has been linked to mental illness in some cases. Um, I read an interesting story about these mommy, they call them like mommy bloggers or mom blog websites, um, where usually, I mean, the stereotype is stay-at-home moms, but I think it's everybody, uh, go on these parenting and family websites and will argue with each other about things like sugar-free, gluten-free, vegan, paleo, whatever, and they'll tear each other alive over, you know, cloth diapers or disposables or whatever. Um, and I forget what the statistic was, but I read in a parenting magazine that apparently a huge number of... Um, Women who identify as stay-at-home mothers have actually lost friends as a result of criticisms over their parenting styles. It's crazy, and I wonder to what degree the internet has to do with that. Um, in some cases, you know, there are stories that we know about cyberbullying um, among teenagers. It's not the same as trolling, but it, it's a similar kind of using the internet to sort of be a vindictive type of personality. Um, and there are stories, there are not that many, luckily, but there are some, um, of teenagers committing suicide because of stuff that's happened to them on the internet because of the way social media, um, in some cases, used to bully them. Um, and it's particularly sad when you consider that teenagers are already, you know, sort of in a place where things like bullying and peer pressure are already so tough to then add this way of bullying, this, this particularly um, aggressive form. It's, it's interesting. Um, I actually posted a, a funny little picture uh, on the Punctora website about this. It's, uh, one does not simply go to bed when someone is still wrong on the internet. And there are some people who are like that. There's all these cartoons of like, you know, honey, come to bed. Oh, I can't. Someone's wrong on the internet. Right? So these things exist, um, I guess. And this is really important to some people. So 
It then begs a, a very important question to me, which is, would you rather be right or would you rather be happy? I mentioned earlier that Parsha Truma is about the details of the construction of God's dwelling place on earth. Now, those are details you want to get right. You know, and there are lots of details. It's about how the wood planks together, and then it has these little singlets on it, and you, you stick a rod through it, and that holds the wood together. But then you also have these little rings that go on the top that hold each of the planks together. So very, very complicated, as I said earlier, Ikea-esque method for putting stuff together. Those are details you want to get right. The priestly texts that talk about how to offer these sacrifices in the proper way. These are the things that people wanted to get right. It's why it was written in such detail. But what about everything else in life? Two questions. Do we bring God's holiness into the world if we're right all the time? All the time. Do we bring God's holiness into the world if we are right all the time? And the second question is, does God somehow give us bonus points when we're right and everyone knows it? So we could say, we could make the argument that if we know what we're doing is right, if we know that what we believe is right, and we sincerely believe with conviction that other people should believe the way we do, then in a sense we would say, well, yes, I'm bringing God's holiness into the world clearly because God is on my side. I am right. God should be on my side because I'm right. And, uh, and we need to put that out there. Or I need to put that out there. right? So that's the idea with that. But then it comes into the second question, which is, does God reward us or reward the world with holiness if everyone knows we're right? So see, that's where I think it gets to be a little tricky. Because we can always convince ourselves that we're right and that <clears throat> we are doing God's will by being right. The tricky thing, though, is then when we then say that in order for God's holiness through our rightness or righteousness um, to be manifested in the world, the world has to agree with us, right? The world has to accept our ideas, right? The world has to say, you know what? You know, you, you got it. You, you are totally correct. This is exactly uh, what this is all about, right? So that's where it gets to be a little bit tricky is when we sort of tell ourselves like, well, somehow it'll only happen. You know, my, my vision of tikkun olam is only going to happen if it's realized by other people, right? That's where I think we stumble a little bit. At least I think that's where I stumble, right? I think that's kind of a tough period for some people. And that's where, you know, I get into asking myself this question of would I rather be right or would I rather be happy? So I started asking myself that question. It's not original to me at all, this phrase, be right or be happy. Totally not original to me at all. Um, I started asking myself this question years ago when I was in rock bands. So when you're in a rock band, it's kind of like dating and being in a business at the exact same time with, with people that you are not actually romantically att attached to, right? So it's all of, the, uh, all of the disadvantages of being in a business relationship and in a romantic relationship, but with none of the money and none of the romance. Uh, that's what being a musician, I think, is a lot like, because you're with these people, whether it's men or women or whatever the case may be, and you're trying to build this art, you're trying to create a product, you're trying to put it out in the marketplace, um, and so you have that business in, but then you also have the personal dynamics of people getting along with each other, Sometimes people in a band date each other, depending on the circumstances, so you have that kind of stuff to deal with. Um, you have different people's different emotional issues, lifestyle issues, whatever, and that all kind of goes into this big soup of personality conflicts <clears throat> and all of these other things. So I started thinking when I was a musician about this idea of being right and being happy. So I'd have an idea for something that I wanted, whether it was the way to structure a song, or maybe it was the marketing idea for an album, 
or maybe it was a t-shirt design. I mean, it didn't really matter, right? We, when you're in a band or you, you own a company or you have a project or something like that, we're working with lots of people, you have to make lots of different small decisions. And of course, we always believe that we're right and that everybody else is wrong. It's just the natural kind of human instinct. So I'd come up with an idea for something, and if a bandmate disagreed with me, um, I'd have to ask myself whether I'd be right, whether I'd like to be right on the issue, or be happy. And sometimes when it comes to being happy, it means avoiding conflict altogether. Now, that can be tricky. Some people would say that's passive-aggressive. And, and fair point to that, by the way. There are some people who avoid all conflict altogether just to be um, passive-aggressive. And you do, you, know, you do have to walk that fine line because it's possible. Um, but they're not avoiding conflict in order to be happy. They're avoiding conflict in a way of sort of punishing themselves, which is a whole, whole other thing, or to punish the other person. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about would you rather be right or would you rather be happy? When I chose to be happy instead of being right, something funny happened. I found myself, at times, incredibly happy. I realized that by closing my mouth, by not getting involved, by allowing the sort of waters of time to flow over me like a rock, so you imagine a, a creek with all these rocks in it and, and, and the water just flowing around the rocks, the smooth circles you know, over and around the top, <clears throat> as opposed to being like a dam, right? As opposed to being a series of boulders that block the water and push them, right? Instead, just being sort of peaceful about it and just allowing the waters of time, the waters of argument, the waters of hostility, the waters of discontent, disagreement, no matter how little or severe it is. It doesn't have to be big issues. Just allowing that stuff to pass by. I found that the things that I thought were incredibly important, the things that I had to spend my time on, the things that there were, there was no way I couldn't speak up. There was no way I couldn't be right. There's no way my idea couldn't win. I found that when I gave those things up and allowed that sort of water of time to flow over me, um, that I found myself incredibly happy. By closing my mouth, by not getting involved, um, a lot of those issues went away. Now, Maybe it was because ultimately someone else's idea was better, and oftentimes it is. Oftentimes we are convinced that we are right, that we have it right the whole time. And then when someone else has an opportunity to challenge you to do something a little bit different, well, there you go. Actually, they were right all along. And isn't it good that you didn't stick up for whatever it was that you thought was right, because... In the end, you would have been wrong anyway, and then you would have been sort of hurt and angry and, and hostile towards yourself and towards this other person, right? So that's one thing that can happen. Another thing that can happen is that whatever the issue is that you're dealing with simply goes away, right? So how many times have we caught ourselves in, let's say, in arguments with a spouse or with a friend where we just, we knew this was an issue that would never go away and it just had to be resolved, and it had to be resolved by our idea working out, right? Our plans being made. And then you give it up, and you decide to just be happy, and you find out it was never an issue to begin with, right? It didn't matter, let's say, in that band that I was in, if the t-shirts were black or white, or if the logo was this big or that big. That these things didn't really matter, because maybe we didn't print those shirts anyway. Maybe we went with buttons. Or maybe it didn't matter that I wanted to see this movie and you want to see that movie because we went out to dinner instead, right? It didn't matter because those things didn't even end up happening anyway. Or, shockingly enough, sometimes by not speaking up, people will actually go with your idea. They'll find their way towards it. And then it gets to be not your idea that you forced on everyone and that maybe it ended up being right, but no one's really interested and it feels like you forced it on them, um, maybe they arrived at that conclusion on their own. And then it's not your idea, it's everyone's idea. And that's particularly cool. I like when that happens. Um, because not only have you given up 
and you've allowed people to reach your conclusion. But it's not your conclusion anymore. It's their conclusion. And maybe actually they are, the way they arrived at that decision, the way that they arrived at their understanding of that detail is better than how you are going to promote it in the first place, right? Maybe you had a certain idea, but the way you came about it was wrong. Maybe the way they came about it was right, and they can influence you in a particularly good way. And sometimes our ideas work out, and sometimes they don't. But at least it gives it a fair shot. And at least you're giving other people an opportunity by allowing yourself to be happy instead of being right. At least you're giving people a fair shot. You're giving them a chance. You know, it's not all about you. So in thinking about this, I want you to ask yourself going into this Shabbat, are there details that just don't matter, ultimately? As we talked about in the beginning, the details. There are details that do matter. The building of the Mishkan and Parsha Truma matters. But are there details that when it comes to building God's holiness on earth just don't quite matter? So that the second question would be, do you ever feel the need to make others unhappy so that you can be right? Do you ever feel the need to make others unhappy so that you can be right? And then finally, the bigger question. Would you rather be right or happy? It's an interesting question. So we're going to have a little bit of a commercial break, and when we come back, we are going to uh, have our Kaddish and our Misha Barak. You've always wanted to serve the Jewish community as a rabbi. Fantastic. But there's a problem. You don't have the time or the financial resources to attend rabbinical school. What if there was a way to learn everything you needed to know to be a Jewish leader online and at your convenience? Well, now there is. Introducing the Darshan Yeshiva, an online school training lay Jewish spiritual leaders to serve as Darshanim or para-rabbis in their local communities. At the Darshan Yeshiva, you'll gain all the academic knowledge, ritual leadership, and professional skills to lead a Jewish community. And when you're finished studying with us, you'll be ordained as a Darshan, a Jewish teacher, orator, and community organizer. The Darshan Yeshiva uses the latest in streaming video and audio to deliver relevant classes via your Mac or PC. The Darshan Yeshiva is proud to be flexible, allowing you to study anytime at your own pace, affordable with only one flat monthly rate, and committed to your success through our supportive peer and mentor network. So log on to the Darshan Yeshiva and start your Jewish journey with us today. You've always wanted to serve the Jewish community as a rabbi. So if you're interested in online Jewish education, Darshan Yeshiva is fantastic. Uh, matter of fact, if you sign up for the ordination program, we just put in the um, we just put in the um, classes for holidays. Um, the intro to Judaism class, the holidays are going to be up next week. So really good time to go on ahead and check that out. You'll be ahead of the curve uh, by a few days. So as we wind down our Shabbat service, um, I want to do three things. The first thing I want to do is uh, have us say the Shema together, and then I want to have uh, Kaddish, and then we will uh, have a Misha Barak. So we begin with our Shema, which is the uh, central blessing in Judaism, and we can say that together. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kevod Malchuto Leolam Vahed We remember those who have passed away, those whom we have loved and lost. We remember the Victims of terrorism, both in Israel and in everywhere else around the world. We remember the victims of the Holocaust uh, and other persecutions of the Jewish people. We remember 
those who do not have living relatives uh, to say Kaddish for them. In addition, if there are any other names that need to be included in our uh, Kaddish, um, please <clears throat> put their names in the chat room and um, we will make sure to have them in our prayers as well. So with that, we have our Mourner's Kaddish. Yit Kadal v'yit Kadash Shemei Rabba Bialma divera chirute Bialmlich malchute Bechayechon uviyomechon ubechaye de chol beit Yisrael Bagala uvizman kariv veimru amen Yehe Shemei Rabba mevarach liolam ulalme almaya Yit barach Vishtabach, Vit Baar, Vit Romam, Vit Nase, Vit Hadar, Vit Ale, Vit Halal, Shemei de Kudesha, Berichu. Leela, Min Kol, Birchata, Vishirata, Tushbechata, Benechemata, Damiran, Bealma, Vimru, Ame. Yehe, Shlama, Rava min Shamaya, Bechayim Aleinu, the Al Kol Yisrael, the Imru Amen. O Se Shalom Bimromal, Hu Yaase Shalom Aleinu, the Al Kol Yisrael, the Imru Amen. We finish with the statement He who makes peace in the heavenly heights, may He bring peace upon us and upon all Israel. Amen. So we remember all of those whom we loved and lost. May their memories serve as a source of blessing and comfort to all of us. And let us say, Amen. We also include a time of healing. Um, you know, not only do we want to remember those that uh, we have lost, but we need to remember the people that are present. One of the ways we do that here in the One Shul community is that we have our prayer request wall. So you can go on that anytime. It's free. There's no nothing you need to do. Um, and you can type in a request. So I'm going to include that here in the chat room. Um, pull that up here for everybody. So anytime that you need to use that, it's available and people around the world are praying for you. Um, and so I'd like to just give a few of the most recent, um, uh, give a few of the most recent um, posts that people have done. Um, I'm not excluding anyone purposefully. We just want to go on ahead and give a few at the top here. Um, a uh, prayer uh, request for uh, Rochelle, who uh, has surgery. Uh, we have someone who is looking for a restoration of their relationship with their boss. Um, uh, help a, a sister to improve her relationship with her husband. Um, someone who uh, has an, uh, employment issues, they're asking God for um, comfort and strength to deal with um, rejection. We have another um, person here who's having some financial issues, uh, Stephen. Um, uh, ask for a prayer for a son named Isaac who's seven and has Down syndrome and is uh, facing some troubles. Uh, please pr uh, pray for Auntie Anna Marie who is critically ill in the hospital. Um, prayer for peace. Uh, pray for Jeanette Abigail. Uh, to uh, help her and her family. Please pray for Wallace. Uh, please pray for Stuart. So lots of lots of prayer requests here. So please keep these and other people in mind. Please go through the, um, uh, the one shoal prayer request wall and keep these people uh, in your hearts. They're part of our community and we need to keep them in mind. We pray for all of those who are with us live and <clears throat> through our uh, archive. Hope that you have a healing uh, of mind, body, and spirit, and let us say, Amen. 
That's all for right now. Please join us for the 7 o'clock Rosh Chodesh service with Ketzira. Uh, so it's a Rosh Chodesh and Shabbat service, and that's at 7 o'clock Eastern time. On Saturday, there is a 7 o'clock Mariv and Havdalah, um, and then we start all over again on Monday with insights into the sages and Torah study. So please uh, make sure to come back to all the great stuff we have going on. Um, another important thing is that we need your help. Uh, we need your help not only through uh, coming to classes and coming to events, but we also need your uh, volunteer support and your financial support. We can't survive without you. We can't do services unless we have people to lead them and we have a website to run them off of. So please get involved, participate. There's lots of different ways you can get involved. You can volunteer to lead a class or a service. Um, you can write, you can fundraise, you can, if you're a techie, you can help with techie type stuff. Um, and then of course there's always giving a donation. So uh, I've included in the chat room a very long link to PayPal. Um, we also have a button up at the top here. You don't have to have PayPal in order to use it. You can use a debit card um, as well. All we ask is five dollars. You know, five dollars for a class or a service. That's less than you would spend going anywhere else, um, and it goes a lot farther as well. It doesn't cost us a lot uh, to run these services, but we do need all the support we can get. So if you can't volunteer, five dollars is a great way to help. So thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing you next time here at One Shul. Take care. Shabbat Shalom.